Hi there, I'm Deaconess Tubby Spear. Welcome to Worship at Good Shepherd Lutheran Church in Oak Park. If this is your first time with us, we are so happy that you are here with us today. We would invite you to use our prayers and more link to share your contact information and we will reach out to you. The link is also a place where you can share your prayer requests and to see the links for uh, various upcoming events at our church. As the season of Lent continues, I want to remind you of a couple of things. First, we will continue to provide you with uh, materials you can use at home as we go throughout our Lenten season. This week, we are focusing on our Lenten offering, which will be going to the ELCA Safe Water Project. We are mindful during the pandemic that uh, washing hands is a critical way to fight against the virus. And yet many people around the world that won't expect to receive the vaccine for many months also have limited access to clean water. So the ELCA Safe Water Project is a way that we can provide uh, safe, clean water for people that have that need. We would invite you to continue to collect your offerings at home, and we will uh, be collecting those here at the church closer to Easter. Second, uh, we will be deliver delivering another installment of Lent materials to you this week. They will include uh, several items that will help you be interactive uh, with our Lenten theme. And we also are including um, our membership directory, which has contact information for all of the people at Good Shepherd, as well as a ministry directory, which uh, lists the ministries that we offer here at church, who's in charge, and how to get connected. You had received in your last installment a piece of fabric that you were invited to write on and perhaps color. We would like to collect those back from you. So one way that you could do this is when your second bag is dropped off, you may want to provide a way for your fabric strip to be picked up. So that can be uh, either arranged to be on your porch, at your door, or um, an exchange if that person is able to knock on your door and receive that from you. Watch for an email with more information about this. Thirdly, our Lenten evening services on Wednesdays continue. Uh, it involves uh, social time at 6.30, uh, worship at 7 with hold an evening prayer, and communion at 7.30. This is on Wednesday nights. You are invited to attend uh, one or all components of the evening. They all share the same Zoom link, which you will be able to find in your weekly e-blast. Today's theme is Water Marks the Prophetic Word. The prophets were given the unenviable task of calling out the evil that God's people were doing and their complicity of evil in the world. Just as a few drops of water can become a flood, so can our actions come together to create uh, more evil in the world or to be a source of God's goodness. So today we will be exploring that theme. And now, faith community, let our worship together begin. Blessed be the Holy Trinity, one God, the source of steadfast love, the keeper of the covenant, our rock and our salvation. God hears us when we cry and draws close to us in Jesus Christ. Together, let us return to the one who is full of compassion. I invite you into silence as we continue with confession. Fountain of living water, pour out your mercy over us. Our sin is heavy and we long to be free. Rebuild what we have ruined and mend what we have torn. Wash us in your cleansing flood. Make us alive in the spirit to follow the way of Jesus as healers and restorers of the world you so love. Amen. Friends, God's word never fails and God's promise rests on grace by the saving love of Jesus Christ. Our sins are forgiven and God remembers them no more. Let us journey in the way of Jesus. Amen. Peace be with you. Peace. 
peace be with you. Peace. Peace be with you. And, and peace, peace be with, with you. you. So today's lesson is about how little things can add up to make a big difference. I gotta admit, I was a little stumped about this, so I decided to take a walk. And it sort of came to me. So, you know, we've all walked around our neighborhoods, perhaps we've walked through the woods, we've walked around our Oak Park. And many of you probably have seen things like this. Yep, litter, trash, things that have just been discarded on the side. And you thought to yourself, so what? It's just one little thing, doesn't make a big difference. Well, to all the little animals and so forth, it does make a big difference. They can eat it, choke on it, and it's one less of them that we have around us. Not to mention the fact that it makes the place look pretty bad. So, let's go into a pretend. Let's pretend that someone picked one thing up. One thing, one can, one bag, anything. Well, that's one less of them. Then let's say once someone else sees them do that, and they decide, I'm going to pick something up too. So now there's two. And what if that makes you feel good, so you pick up a third? Or you organize a group of friends, and you all grab a garbage bag, and you go through the woods and pick up a bunch of things. So now we have clean woods. It also means that the animals have more places for clean food. They're not going to mistake a plastic bag and choke on it. So now we have more bunnies, more squirrels, more good things. It also means that the plants around us don't have to compete to grow. So now we have healthier, more grass, flowers, trees. That means that they can make oxygen and clean the world, and we have more to breathe. Ta-da! All of a sudden, the whole world has benefited because one person decided to take the time to pick up one little thing and they can make that kind of difference. Pretty cool, huh? pray. God of the journey, we wander through the wilderness hoping to find what we are searching for. As we search, may we be strengthened by your presence, our water in the desert, our rainbow after the storm. Amen. This is the reading for March 7th from the book of Hosea. Hear the Lord's word, people of Israel. For the Lord has a dispute with the inhabitants of the land. There's no faithful love or loyalty and no knowledge of God in the land. Swearing, lying, murder, together with stealing and adultery are common. Bloody crime followed by bloody crime. Therefore, the earth itself becomes sick and all who live on it grow weak. 
together with the wild animals and the birds in the sky, even the fish of the sea are dying. Word of God, Word of Life. The Holy Gospel according to Matthew, the 14th chapter. Immediately, Jesus made the disciples get into the boat and go on ahead to the other side while he dismissed the crowds. And after he had dismissed the crowds, he went up to the mountain by himself to pray. When evening came, he was there alone. But by this time, the boat, battered by the waves, was far from the land, for the wind was against them. And early in the morning, Jesus came walking towards them on the lake. But when the disciples saw him walking on the lake, they were terrified and saying, it's a ghost. And they cried out for fear. But immediately Jesus spoke to them and said, take heart, do not be afraid, it is I. Peter answered him, Lord, if it is you, command me to come out to you to the water. Come, Jesus said. And so Peter got out of the boat and started walking on the water and came towards Jesus. But when he noticed the strong wind, Peter became frightened and began to sink and he cried out, Lord, save me. Jesus immediately reached out his hand and caught Peter saying to him, you of little faith, why do you doubt? When they got into the boat and the wind ceased and those in the boat worshiped Jesus saying, Truly, you are the Son of God, the Gospel of the Lord. When I was a new mother, one of the things that I made as a commitment to myself was that I wouldn't use physical violence against my children. I wouldn't spank them. Now, I want you to understand this is not a sermon about parenting styles. It's not about whether someone else should be using spanking within their own parenting. Um, toolkit, if you will, but rather this is about my journey with an understanding of myself and an understanding of my relationship with God. I remember that when my children were newly born, I had this profound sense of their fragility and my power. I could understand like how much strength I had compared to the little amount of strength that they had. Even as they were growing, there was this differential in the sense of, of strength and power. On top of that, I could remember back to the times when um, I had been uh, corrected when I was young through spanking or through hitting. And 
by my hair and my age, you can probably tell that I was raised at a time period when it was okay for teachers to hit, for parents to hit, for neighbors to hit children. That was allowed. And so, yeah, I can remember that feeling of when I was being hit, especially by others, but even my parents, that feeling of shame, that feeling of anger that was taking place in those moments. And yet, I can tell you that that's not the reason that I chose to not hit my children. It really was about that sense of understanding that when I unleash my violent tendencies, when I allow that anger to be released by a slap, that I really don't know ultimately whether it'll be a pat or a slap or a wallop or a beating that once I allow that rage to come up from me and be released, that it has a life of its own, that violence is not something that I wanna release within myself. And it was from there that I sat back and said, I am afraid of what will happen if I raise my hand to my children, and I vowed that I would never do that. We have this series in Lent here where we started off with the understanding of God creating all goodness in the universe. That God creates this wonderful Eden and puts humanity in the midst of it. And in that wonderful place of Eden, there's an abundance. Everything is good. Everyone has what they need. Every being is at peace with another being. And that's the way that God creates the universe. And then last week we started talking about how evil is a part of our world and went back to those stories of Adam and Eve who first decide that they want what God already has, which is this power to create this world that has all this abundance. And so they are moved outside of this place for their own good and for the sake of the universe. And then the next story that we have is Cain and Abel. And Cain has a desire for what Abel wants in this universe and kills him in order to get it. But as I lifted up the story, I also talked about God in the midst of that. What does God do in each one of these places? You see, so much of what we think that God is doing here is punishing, is acting out of that sense of anger, of indignation, of righteousness. And so we assume that God hurts Cain, when in fact an examination of the story says that God protects Cain from the violent tendencies of the rest of humanity. And the stories, and I think up of that story of Noah and the ark, when we have the story that's in there that says God does get so angry at humanity and all the evil that's taking place and God just wipes out all but a small little component. But the story tells us that God resents and regrets that behavior that God has just taken place and promises never to use violence again in our relationship, that that would not be the way that God acts with us ever again. A foundational story of how we believe our relationship with God is. Some time ago, within the last two decades, I came across the work of Rene Girard, someone who uh, lived in our time period. And he had this understanding. He was an atheist, and he started looking at literature. He was actually someone who studied French literature to begin with and then moved on from there. It became a part of philosophy and moved into theology. But he said that in the basics of our stories, and our stories tell about our human history, our own human tendencies, he noticed that there was this, this thing that he called mimetic theory. And the basis of it is that what you have is what I want. What you have, I want. And from that desire of wanting what you have, I seek to get it from you. And so much of literature is all about that. You have the girl I want. You have the job I want. And so I go after it, and I go to take it from you. And in most cases, the literature would sit back, and in order to justify my taking it from you, it turns the person who has 
what I want into a scapegoat. They are wrong, they're evil, there's something that they're doing that causes me to be okay with the fact that I went after what you have. And in the stories, there's violence that happens to the person who has the thing that is the object of desire. And then we turn the story and the story is that they were the one who was wrong. Gerard looked at so many of literature and then moved into the story of myth, the Greek gods, and eventually came across the Bible. Gerard was an atheist and he looked at the Bible through the eyes of literature. And what he said is, the Bible turns that story on its end. What you have, I desire. And I seek to go ahead and try and get it from you and I do things to you. And yet, you are not the one who was turned into the wrong, the evil, the villain of the story, and in fact, you become the champion of the story. He lifts up the story of Joseph. The story of Joseph is embedded over and over and over again with people who want what Joseph has. It starts off with his brothers. His brothers want that love that Joseph seems to have, that coat that he has. They want it from him. And so they do evil against him. But in the end of the story, Joseph turns around and saves them he saves them. He repairs. He repairs that relationship. And even in that story, again, we have that time when he is in the, the household of Potiphar, and it's the desire of Potiphar's wife who wants him, and he holds back from it, and he's thrown into jail, and it's Joseph who, at the end of the story, is saving Potiphar and all of Egypt. The Bible turns that story of what I desire and this turning of somebody into a scapegoat on its end. Gerard looked at the story of Jesus Christ. And Jesus Christ is someone who the religious leaders and even the secular leaders are noticing as gaining power and they are people who want power, they desire power, they do all that they can to hold on to power. And Jesus is lifted up and killed as in so many of those stories of how it moves forward and someone is killing the object, the, the person who has the object of their desire. And yet in the story, Jesus comes back. And in the story, Jesus doesn't become the one who was wrong and justify the violence that was against him. And in fact, what ends up happening is that Jesus is so innocent and so good that it turns the understanding of violence on its head to the point that we sit back and finally understand, oh my gosh, God never expected and wanted violence from us. This is something within us. This is not about God. It shifts the story about what God wants. We happen to be inheritors of the medieval understanding of this under understanding of what God wanted in Jesus Christ, that we were so sinful, that we were so horrid, that God just kept accumulating this understanding of what was owed in this relationship, that we were owing something back to God, but that it accumulated to such an immense amount that the only way that it could be taken care of is that God would send God's self down into the world and kill God as the scapegoat in order to allow for the relationship to be healed. But Gerard and those who follow say, in that telling of it, we're just duplicating this understanding of the mimemic theory. The object of our desire causes us to kill that person. We continue that understanding of the role of violence in our relationship with God. And yet they would say that that's not what God ever, ever wanted from us. Gerard sits back and says that what the Bible reveals to us is that our desire 
for violence is on us. It's not on God. And he goes on to say that we still might understand that there's wickedness in the world, but we can't blame God for that. And we certainly can't say that God is out here and bringing violence to us in order to atone for the violence that we do. What set me on this journey for this week, this understanding was reading about a week ago, this statistic, and I, and I know that it's out there, but I think it was the number of the statistic that set me off. And it said that two thirds of religious Christians in the United States believe that God is using the pandemic in order to force us to change something about ourselves. Once again, I was hearing the story that God is using something that is going to be killing people in order to tell us that we're wrong. That once again, God is using evil and violence to make a point. And I know that that part of Christianity has been strong and it's been a part of our theology for at least 500 years, perhaps even longer. But for most of us, it's been difficult to reconcile that understanding of God who condones violence with our understanding of Jesus Christ who so abhorred violence that he would rather just let it happen to him than to lift a hand. That instead the story is about a Jesus Christ who as he's walking on water and somebody says, I want what you have, God. I want to walk on water. And Jesus says, okay. Knowing this is not something that humanity has ever been able to do. And Peter does it for a bit and then realizes his humanity and that he's not really God and begins to sink. But, but does Jesus just say, well, there you go again, Adam. Why did you think that you could get what I wanted, what I have? There you go again, Eve. Why did you think that you could be a God? God extends God's hand to the sinking Peter and says, well, that didn't work the way you thought it would, and lifts him up out of the water and back into the boat. The disciples get yet another glimpse of who this God is. The thing is that we don't always get that understanding of our relationship with God very well. But I will say that somewhere along the line, in myself, I understood that God wasn't calling me to be a violent person, to let that violent urge to come out from me. And perhaps it took looking one time at the beautiful face of my innocent children to say, woof, this is goodness incarnate. This new little baby here is so wonderful. They helped me understand that if God is parent, that God would do no less than what I was thinking at that moment when I made a pledge to that tiny child that I would never lift a hand to the goodness that was there in front of me. I can't believe that God is any less than the best that I am. I can't believe that God isn't even surpassing whatever goodness that I can rally up within me. Truth is, I still have violent tendencies. There's still people that I would like to smite if I only had the power. But I no longer believe that that's what God is calling to me to. I no longer believe that God is calling violence into this world, but rather that God is there, as Jesus is there, when we get it wrong to hold out a hand and lift us back up out of the mire and put us back on the steady ground that we might try again today to get it better. Amen.
Let us pray. Holy Spirit of compassion and healing, with our hearts overflowing with gratitude for all that we can name and all that we have forgotten, we remember that too many lives are flooded with pain. As we feel our own scars and know our own emptiness, we pray that you will comfort and protect all who live in pain and fear. all whose lives are marked by violence all whose morning has not yet been turned into dancing today we pray especially for gary who suffered a heart attack and his family for kirsten karen ellie bevin and sam for abby elaine and all who are grieving Pam, Liz, Kathy, Lauren and others being treated for cancer for children who are struggling with the impact of school closures for the homeless and hungry for those struggling through the impacts of too much cold and snow for those who are distributing and administering the covid vaccine we offer prayers of thanks for the healing and recovery of amber as leaders make decisions that affect all of our lives we pray for wisdom may your justice roll down like waters and your righteousness like an ever flowing stream as seas rise and deserts grow we pray for mercy as nations threaten war we pray for peace we pray for those who are close to us and those we do not know for those who do not believe that prayers are heard and for those who have asked for prayers we pray with grateful hearts for those who have gone before us and now rest in their heavenly home we lift up these prayers and all that you know that we need in the name of your son jesus christ our lord who taught us to pray our father in heaven hallowed be your name your kingdom come your will be done on earth as in heaven give us today our daily bread forgive us our sins as we forgive those who sin against us lead us not into temptation but deliver us from evil for the kingdom the power and the glory are yours now and forever amen We believe in an innovative God who does not wait for us to find ourselves, but comes seeking the lost and calling us into a new way. We believe in Jesus of Nazareth as God's crucial initiative, that when Jesus calls us to follow, Christ also gives us the power to become, both in creed and deed, the children of the living God. We believe in the spirit by whom Jesus still comes to us, calling us to follow into an obedience which is true liberty and to a humble service which is the fruit of holy friendship. We believe in the church as the fellowship of Christ's people, called to respect and support one another through joys and tribulations as we travel the road towards the promised land of God's future. Because Christ has called us, in this we truly believe. Amen.
a benediction using the words of Anne Lamott. We cannot fully understand the mystery of God's grace, only that it meets us where we are, only that it does not leave us where it found us. It can be received gladly or grudgingly in big gulps or in little tastes, like a deer at the salt. I gobbled it up, licked it, held it between my little hooves. And so, through Jesus Christ and the work of the Holy Spirit, may you leave fully sated by God's grace. Amen. Thank you.